today Scott Wilson and I are going to introduce you to someone who I believe has more knowledge about aquatic plants than anyone else in the state. He has spent the last 30 years developing treatment wetlands all over the world. He even wrote a book on the subject. His name is Dr. Bob Knight. A big thank you goes out to our good friend Tracy Marinella who set this interview up. The three of us met Dr. Knight at the Sweetwater Wetlands Park located on the north side of Payne's Prairie. Dr. Knight designed and built this treatment wetland almost five years ago. The three of us couldn't wait to hear his position on aquatic spraying, so Tracy's first question was what did he think about treating aquatic plants with chemical herbicides? Um, it's, there's real downsides to it, and uh, some of them are obvious. One is it costs money. Uh, two, it uh, kills the plants, in many cases just right away, and it kills everything indiscriminately. A lot of the herbicides do. Reward is the one that I've seen where FWC will go out and spray it. Yeah. Uh, and I learned about it uh, when I was uh, doing a study of the Wekiva River and Rock Springs Run. Uh, they were out uh, spraying uh, the Rock Springs Run with Reward, and it's and I, you know, talked to the the FWC guys or the contractors for FWC that were doing it, and they just were spraying. There was taro out there, and they said they were trying to control taro as well as water lettuce and other things. And, and um, so I actually was monitoring the system at the time. I actually had uh, oxygen meters out there in the water to measure the productivity of the, of the spring run while they were doing that before and after for a period of weeks. And, and it was just obvious what happened as those plants died, there's a sag in the oxygen level in the water because you got all this rotting plant material settling to the bottom. And that sag lasts a significant amount of time uh, and then, of course, the plants that were providing oxygen are gone as well uh, because you've killed al at least the ones that were contacted by the reward. Uh, so the, I don't think that kills submerged plants, but it sure kills emergent plants. And it, the big problem that I saw in Wakaiva and Rock Springs Run was aquatic weed management was resulting in black organic sediments, incredibly um, terrible sediments in terms of a natural uh, spring run plant community. So I, I really did not favor that at all. And of course the spring run keeps itself open. It basically is moving all the time. And we just had a wonderful presentation at the Springs Institute this um, this week. Yeah, this week on Tuesday, uh, Dr. Jason Evans, who's a longtime expert on um, problems with controlling invasive plants. He's a good person to talk to. He's at Stetson University. He, he found out that water lettuce is a native, and he's proven it. He's published it and widely, and it was, it's in the fossil record, uh, it's in the pollen record, uh, and it's in Bartram's travels. And so water lettuce, which is a, one of their main plants they go after on a lot of lakes, is a native plant. And, and I, you know, I, I think hydrilla, we ought to start calling it native. It's here, it's not going away. The, uh, a plant that or any kind of invasive species that gets established has got a reason for being here. It's because there's an empty niche that uh, needs to be filled and uh, that's like the snail kites. So snail kites never came up to North Florida 10 years ago. Never seen up here. Uh, the island apple snail, which is an exotic apple snail. We have a native apple snail and that's what snail kites eat. Well, we got the exotic apple snails came in in the 70s or 80s sometime. And, and they're pretty widespread in Florida. And so when the planters brought the plants over here, we assumed that they brought some eggs in these plants when they planted this wetland. But there already were apple, uh, the exotic apple snails we know on the Noonan's Lake, which feeds into the prairie. So they could have been here on the prairie as well. But what happened as soon as the, the wetland was planted, the plants start to develop, the apple snails lay in eggs everywhere. Uh, we got just Boku apple snails. And since then we've gone from Zero limpkins in this area are very few, up to about almost a thousand this year, and the highest count anywhere in the United States uh, for the last like three years now. And snail kites are up here. A hundred uh, was, I think, ninety some was the count on the Christmas bird count a few weeks ago. So th there's unexpected things with these exotic animals and plants, and uh, humans tend to make up their own subjective judgment whether or not they're good or bad, and that's. That's just dangerous because it depends on who the human is that has control at the time. And if the point of aquatic plant management is, um, is, is to support the companies that make the herbicides, 
I definitely don't agree with that. You know, why should we favor them over the natural aquatic systems that need to be protected? Um, if it's to keep FWC a job, I'm sure there's other things they could be doing other than that. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I, I would say we could probably cut back on a very large part of our state sponsored aquatic plant management in the state. I think that in terms of fishing, and I've heard the fishermen on Orange Lake, they'd rather just have fishing channels out there and not uh, take all the plants out of the lake. And same thing on Lake Rousseau and the bird watchers. And you know, fishermen aren't the only people who use lakes. Bird watchers love these lakes that are vegetated. And so as long as you can paddle a canoe, paddle a kayak, run a small boat, and of course you can run an airboat over anything, um, then we should leave a lot more plants. And to remove plants, I think, uh, mechanical harvesting is not a bad way to do it. I don't think it's a panacea, but it's sure a lot better than putting poisons out in the environment. Amen. Thank you for that, Bob. As we were listening to Dr. Knight, you could hear airboats in the background. We knew what they were. The FWC was surveying the prairie to get ready to spray it with herbicides. So we asked Dr. Knight what he thought about the prairie getting sprayed with chemicals. Well, everything I've said about lake supplies to the prairie. I don't think it's necessary. Most of the time, I don't think it's necessary to be spraying with those herbicides. I, my line to FWC when they were having uh, public workshops on Orange Lake was that you're not accounting for the damage you're doing when you spray. You're, you're thinking that you're increasing habitat for something, but that, you know, the Amphiuma population out in Orange Lake, when it was fully populated with plants, you remember that about 10 or, 10 or 15 years ago, it was just, it was incredibly, it got really low back in 2012, and it just got dominated by Ponadaria pickleweed. It was just beautiful out there. And, and the, the population of Amphiuma at that time was, it was like one for every square meter or something, and there were like millions of Amphiuma in that lake, and they were gonna go out and spray 5,000 acres of that uh, vegetation with no consideration at all of what they were killing, the amphibians. And amphibians are higher animals. I mean, these are not just invertebrates, you know. We pretty much you know, kill insect larvae and mosquito larvae and things like that willy-nilly, but you start killing animals that big that a great blue heron can eat and, and it'll last them, you know, a week after it eats one of those amphiumas. That's a big deal. And they weren't accounting for that. So I was really encouraging them to do pre and post monitoring for any aquatic plant management. And they just, that's what they should be doing. That they shouldn't be spending their time figuring out what to spray. They should be figuring it, using their time to really determine what the effects are of spraying and then reduce it to the level that's safe for the environmental resource that they're supposed to be protecting. Thank you. What's, what, whatever's best for the wildlife, not what's best for some herbicide company. Listen to Dr. Knight as he explains how plants take nitrogen out of the water. Nitrogen is lost to the atmosphere. You know, the air around us is 80% nitrogen. And then uh, luckily there's a biological process that converts the nitrogen that's in the water to nitrogen gas. It's called denitrification. And it occurs, that's why people build wetlands is because wetlands are, have an anaerobic uh, environment right down at the sediments and there's a lot of carbon. The wetland plants are producing carbon, uh, fixed carbon, reduced carbon, uh, through photosynthesis. That, those are the two ingredients uh, needed in combination with nitrogen for the natural microbes to remove the nitrogen. It's a very effective process, and this wetland is designed exactly for that. That was the whole purpose of this wetland, was to remove the nitrogen. That was uh, what it was mandated to do. This year, the FWC sprayed 400 acres of cattails on Lake Okeechobee. So Tracy asked him if he thought it was a good idea to spray cattails. Uh, cattails aren't a problem for a treatment wetland. They're not a problem for wildlife. Uh, there's a lot of mystery in Florida that cattails are bad. They're not bad, they're a native plant, uh, but they do favor high nutrient conditions. And that's why they work so good in wetlands. In fact, they are the the workhorse, the blue collar workers in the treatment wetland. They produce more carbon that is necessary for that denitrification than any of the other plants. And so it doesn't make sense to control the cattails unless you're trying to make the place look like a garden. And they do that down in some other treatment wetlands. In the last few years, hydrilla is making a comeback on Orange Lake and the lake is looking better than it has in a long time. 
The FWC is taking credit for this, but all they did was stop spraying the hydrilla. This is Dr. Knight's home lake, so Tracy asked him about this subject. So I duck hunted Orange Lake uh, for years in the 1970s when I first uh, moved back to Florida and um, it was full of hydrilla at the time. It was incredible for ducks and I wasn't fishing it, I was duck hunting it and the ringneck ducks were there by the tens of thousands. Um, and so that was, I knew that was good habitat and then I started hearing more and more about controlling the hydrilla and, and as I uh, did more and more uh, springs work, I was paying attention to that more because like places like R Lake Rousseau is basically a spring-fed lake uh, that uh, they were just trying to nuke every bit of hydrilla out of that lake. And then um, hydrilla came into Wakulla Springs. FWC started a drip poisoning, is like treating cancer, I guess, a drip uh, system on Wakulla that destroyed all the vegetation in the river. And it was, it was tragic because what happened when they killed the hydrilla it just rolled up. There's a lot of current in these springs, and it just rolled up and just rolled all the vegetation right out of the river, completely denuded oh it, including all the Vallisneria and Sagittaria, which has really had difficulty coming back. So uh, I think that um, you can go way too far with uh, the use of aquatic herbicides. And um, there, you think about these, these lakes, uh, they're living systems. They have living organisms in them. Those all living organisms have to eat, and breathe, and drink, and so those things. You know, food is, is just as essential as water and air uh, for all organisms. And when you kill all the food in a lake, uh, or some, whatever's producing the food, you kill the top organisms. And that's I'm especially concerned about that in springs, uh, where we've um, added so much nitrogen. And um, in some cases, they're herbiciding, uh, but we've eliminated our native plant communities. What we see is a depauperation of the wildlife community. And we're doing actual fish counts and proving that now. The fish uh, counts that I did at Silver Springs indicated that the fish populations were down uh, at least 90% when I studied it uh, um, in 2004 compared to when Odom studied it 50 years earlier. And uh, that, and that's, you know, you can see it there in a lake. It's harder to inventory the fish than in a spring. But uh, it's the same issue. These fish can't go to Publix to get something to eat. If it's not there in the lake, they don't eat. They're not there. Uh, they either die or they don't reproduce. I saw firsthand how much an island apple snail can eat when I kept six of them in an aquarium a few years ago. So I asked Dr. Bob what he knew about the appetite of this invasive snail. I, at least I've got it on good authority that when apple, the exotic apple snails got in the Lake Munson up in Tallahassee, it was totally full of hydrilla. The apple snails ate out all the hydrilla in the lake yeah. by themselves. Wow. They denuded the lake of hydrilla. So you mean Mother Nature gave us a predator to control hydrilla and is also a food source for snail kites? but all we do is kill it with chemical herbicides? Why can't we be smarter than that? And I, th I think what's happened is the native apple snail has disappeared because of water quality problems, and that's what's opened the niche for these exotic apple snails. And so often that's the case. It's not just a matter of an exotic plant or animal being introduced. It's because we screwed up the system and we took out the, the native plants or animals that were already occupying what we call you know, a niche. Uh, students coming out of the School of Natural Resources hear a lot about invasive plants and animals as being bad. They're just automatically bad. And then they don't know how to file that with the thing that says, damn, these island apple snails have expanded the range of one of the most endangered birds in Florida, unbelievably, or two of the most endangered birds. Tracy asked Dr. Knight about the experiment that he ran on Crystal River. He used invasive water hyacinths to shade out the algae that had invaded the river. By the time I went back there, after I started the Springs Institute in around 2011, 2012, I, I taught a short course down there for some students from uh, Pennsylvania who wanted to come down to Florida in the wintertime, right? You know, it's a good spring break. And uh, they wanted to see manatees. So we entertained them. Uh, they actually volunteered with me for a couple of weeks. And what I had seen at that time was that Kings Bay had lost probably 95% of its native vegetation. The Vallis area was gone and it was all Valsneri when I was there in the 70s. Uh, it lost all its water clarity. 
when I was there in the 1970s, you could look down in, in Tarpon Springs and see it, see the bottom easily from the surface. And you can't even find it now because of an algal bloom that's a perennial phytoplankton algal bloom that's in Kings Bay. And so I started looking at all the evidence and initially uh, water hyacinths invaded Kings Bay and somebody released them in there. It was a perfect environment for them. It was fresh water. Uh, it was, uh, it, it was, had rising nutrient levels from all the development around the bay. And, and actually they were discharging the city's wastewater to Kings Bay. That's probably why the water hyacinths were doing so well. Um, it's far enough south so they didn't get frozen back to the point where they would get wiped out. Uh, so they came in there and treated them with sulfuric acid. What? In the 60s. And uh, killed the water hyacinths, but they killed a lot of other things too. And then they came back and did other multiple treatments. And since, and then DEP took over aquatic plant management. They kept treating plants in Kings Bay. Is you lost the native plants that competed with the algae. They're not there anymore, sucking up the nutrients and using the light. Uh, and so what I decided to do was at least we could put a band-aid on the system if we put floating aquatic plants around the edge of Kings Bay. Maybe 100, 200 feet out from shore, build floating um, um, just barricades and plant the water hyacinths behind those. So they wouldn't interfere with boating or water skiing and all the other things people do. But they would shade a significant portion of the bay, which would kill that phytoplanktonic algae. All, all the water circulating under those places, the algae would die because it's dark. And so we ran an experiment of that for five years and it was a very interesting time. I had to go up against all the big names oh, in the FWC me. to do that because oh. water hyacinths are a controlled plant. It was like they were controlling water hyacinths better than they were marijuana at that time. Wow. You had to have all the permits in the world to move water hyacinths from point A to point B. I, yeah, I had to have a permit to remove them out of the Santa Fe River and take them to Kings Bay and stuff like that. But I got those permits. The Corps of Engineer, I got the permits from them to put up these floating booms that we put out there. We call it a corral, a hyacinth corral. And I had all these volunteers, including these students, initially helped me build it. And then local people came out in numbers to help me plan it. Um, but it wasn't a big enough area to really measure water quality improvement. I know it was occurring because I know what the potential for water hyacinths is to remove nutrients. I'm sure there was water quality benefits. Uh, we definitely were shading the water excessively well to get rid of the phytoplankton. And then when we pulled those hyacinths out, we looked at the fauna that had developed in the roots and was full of, of life, of invertebrates and vertebrates and small fish and everything under there when scuba diving under there. And it was, you know, it was, a, it was a new salad bar. What a great idea. Put the plants back in the system that were there when the water quality was beautiful. It is so sad that our government will never be able to comprehend that. The FWC is looking for a new director for the Invasive Plant Management Division. They need to give Dr. Knight a call. They could learn a lot from this brilliant man.